<clears throat> My name is Mike Traugott. I'm the director of the ICPSR Summer Program. I'm pleased to welcome you to another in our series of uh, Blaylock Lectures. They're named in honor of Hubert Tad Blaylock, a sociologist who was interested in social theory and also uh, statistics. He was an official representative from the University of Washington to the consortium and he also served on the Consortium Council. We um, have these uh, lectures in the evening uh, because of the full day that you spend in class. And sometimes uh, we, or I, uh, we organize them around threads. And because this is a presidential election year, we've had a theme of uh, estimating election outcomes. We've had a presentation about pre-election polls, a uh, presentation about exit polls, and a presentation about forecasting uh, using surveys of citizens' expectations. And tonight, uh, we have a presentation about statistical models of election outcomes. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us Andrew Gelman, Andrew is a professor of statistics and political science, and he's also the director of the Applied Statistics Center at Columbia University. He's received the Outstanding Statistical Application Award from the American Statistical Association, the award for best article published in the American Political uh, uh, Science Review, and the Council of Presidents of Statistical Societies Award for outstanding contributions by a person under the age of 40. Professor Gelman has done research on a wide range of topics, including why it is rational to vote, why campaign polls are so variable, when elections are so predictable, why redistricting is good for democracy, reversals of death sentences, police stops in New York City, and the probability that your vote will be decisive. Um, he's also been the author, of course, of a great number of books and articles on all of these topics. Um, Andrew is going to organize his presentation around a series of questions that he hopes that you will ask. Um, he, he's prepared to discuss various political and statistical aspects of election forecasts. And maybe I'll get things going, Andrew, by asking you, about your relationship with The Economist and how you got started uh, with The Economist and about this model that you've been working on. Oh, okay. Uh, well, first, great to meet you all. I can't actually see you. Um, I can only see. So the, the, the three people I can see, you're going to have to do me a favor and be like very like emotional. Like you have to laugh really hard at my jokes and when things are confusing, you have to like kind of go like this and, and so forth, because I'm going to need you to represent 100 people in the audience. Um, but I, I wish I could meet you all. It, it seems just like yesterday that, that I was a student myself. I, the Economist, I was just, I was contacted by Elliot Morris, who's a young, um, young data analyst at The Economist, and he and his colleagues were doing an election forecast and asked if I could help. So uh, I, my, uh, there's a student I'm working with, uh, Merlin. I know him because he was the teaching assistant in my class last year. And he worked with me um, to help Elliot make this model. And that's about it. We've been going back and forth on it. I can tell you a little bit about the model. So it, it has three pieces. It has a fundamentals-based forecast. It has polls. And then it has a time series model for how public opinion will ch can change during the campaign. So let's start with the fundamentals based forecast. So you can forecast elections based on what, well, what are called political and economic fundamentals. Uh, the, the term fundamentals is kind of, I don't say sloppy, but it's, it's ill defined. But the, typically, the, the three things that might be in a model like this are recent economic performance as measured in various ways, uh, incumbency, uh, the president running for re-election, and finally, um, presidential approval. And, and 
so we actually they fit a model a fundamentals based model they fit a model for each month like a march model maybe a february model a march model an april model all the way to a november model each time using information from that month to predict the election outcome and training it on all of the elections since 1948 now uh, um, another twist well uh, another twist in this model which we'll get back to in a moment is polarization uh, political polarization um, but the basic idea is that if you look at the political landslides of the past generations, they've all been cases where an incumbent was running for re-election and the economy is booming. And if you look at all the cases where the incumbent lost for re-election, the economy was struggling. Um, and then also uh, more popular presidents tend to do better um, when they're running for re-election. Um, than less popular presidents in terms of approval rating. And finally, approval itself is, and the economy are both less predictive if incumbent is not running for re-election. Uh, so you can put those fac factors together. Wait, you all blanked out your faces. You can't do that. No, I can't see you. <laughs> you can't do that to me. Thank you. I'm right. sorry. I know it's like work to be, be looking at your face, but I need the feedback. I, I, I need it. Okay, so that's the fundamentals based forecast. And the idea, okay, for, for this election, we estimated, we predicted Biden would have 54% of the two party vote from our fundamentals based forecast. Now, the fundamentals based forecast is not perfect. In fact, there's a well known concern of overfitting. Uh, if you just fit a regression, you're cool, you get a standard error and everything works out. But if you take a regression and decide how to parameterize it and which variables to put in based on making it predict well in the past, then you can overfit. So my colleagues did some work to try to avoid that. And one reason we feel it didn't overfit is because some of the past predictions look pretty bad. Um, so we, we don't like it's, it, there's some uncertainty. You can predict, you can forecast the election to within plus or minus about 3% of the vote, um, three percentage points of the vote. So saying that you think Biden's going to get 54% means from the fundamentals, we already think he's, he's going to do well. Um, polarization comes in because these predictors are less important than they used to be. So for example, in 1984, Ronald Reagan won re-election. The economy was, was booming. It was kind of his fault. I mean, the economy was booming partly because he threw it into recession two years, two years earlier. But apparently, he got credit for that. Um, this um, this, in fact, drove, this is, I have a theory that, that the experience of Carter and Reagan drove the early Obama economic policy. So um, Carter, President Carter was elected and the economy improved during his first two years in office. He was recovering, recovering from an earlier recession, but then things tanked in 1979 and 1980 and he got thrown out. Reagan got the recession out of the way first. Now, when Carter was, when Obama was elected president, there was a discussion of stimulus plan. As, as you might know, those of us who are old enough to remember will know that there are a lot of fights about how big the stimulus plan should be. And Republicans didn't want it to be too big, in part because as Republicans, they had a commitment to something approximating a balanced budget and small government. Um, also because the economy bouncing back would be good for Democrats and they didn't want to do that. So this was a rare case in politics where principles and practicality coincided. For Democrats, it was a little bit more complicated, but some Democrats like uh, Paul Krugman certainly wanted a very large stimulus, bring the economy back. But other Democrats such as uh, Lawrence Summers were afraid that if they had too big a stimulus, it would bounce the economy back too fast in 2009 and 2010, leaving Obama vulnerable two years later to a, a Jimmy Carter situation. Now in the event that didn't happen, in retrospect, maybe they shouldn't have been so worried about things bouncing back too fast in 2009 and 2010, but that's easy for me to say now. Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's actually, I, I'm saying all this partly because there's a lot of social science theory, like often, well, you know that saying of Michael Kinsley that the scandal is not what's illegal, it's what's legal, right? Well, similarly in social science, often the most interesting parts are the things that people don't reflect upon. Uh, like, for example, political advertising, there's no doubt that political advertising works. 
I mean, it might not, you can't use political advertising to just win elections like that, but that's partly because the other side is advertising too, right? It's not advertising doesn't work miracles, but few people would doubt that if you spend more money on advertising, you'll probably do better. Uh, it's kind of funny though why that is. I mean, imagine you're a voter and you say, well, I'm trying to decide who to vote for. Well, now this candidate just ran 50,000 TV ads. Well, now I like him better. Well, what is that all about? Like, you'd think it should be that the advertisement's only effective if it's better than expected. Like, that was a really bad, I remember when Reagan was running for re-election, he had an advertisement saying it's morning in America. And I thought, this guy should lose. If that's the best he can say after four years, like, platitude like that, that's terrible. But that's kind of not, not how it operates. But if you reflect a little, why is that? Why does advertising work? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like, you can come up with psychological theories, but it does seem to violate certain principles of, of, of sort of logical reasoning, which, like, believe it or not, it does explain how a lot of people vote. Um, now, here's another example. I told you when you're running for re-election, a good thing would be if, the, if you're, if you're going to be president for four years, um, I guess here I'm speaking to the uh, people uh, born in the United States who are U.S. citizens and who expect to be over 35 someday. If you are president for four years, then what you would really love is for the economy to go down for two years and then go up for the next two, like Reagan. Not like Obama. Obama went down and then it sort of went flat. It didn't go up that fast. You really want to go down and then go up. You know, that V-shaped recovery, just like uh, Trump's been talking about, right? And so that's what you want. What you don't want is for the economy to go up for two years and then go down. That's like harder. But it's a funny thing. In theory, the economy is about like economic statistics or about economic output. Now think of these two graphs. One is the economy goes down and then up and the other is it goes up and then down. So which has higher output? The economy goes down and then up, the output is always below the horizontal line. If the economy goes up and then down, the output's always above the horizontal line. So if it goes up and then down like Jimmy Carter, you have more refrigerators, more ice cream cones, uh, well, that's just cold stuff, more trips to the beach, you know, more, more everything, all, all sorts of things, more CDs, um, uh, more employment over the four years. And if, it, if the other thing happens where it goes down and then up, you have less of everything. So logically, you shouldn't like that. But everybody knows it's better. All people, what people care about is what's been happening recently, right? Well, how, how is that? Like, it's hard. We accept it because it does seem to describe how people think, but it's not at all clear um, why we should think that way. Uh, now Larry Bartels has written about some of this stuff, and he's argued that it actually has to, that Democrats are disadvantaged by this because Democrats, because to serve their constituents, they wanna help them right away. And so they get a Carter-like situation, whereas Republican presidents are more empowered to contract the economy in the beginning. And then, I, I don't know how true that is. It's like small sample size. Like you do see that pattern in the data, but like other things are happening, like 1976, 1980, whatever, each year there, there, there are a lot of things going on. You can't necessarily, attributed to the president. That's the first part of our model, the forecast. The second part of the model is the polls. Well, what we would really like to do is analyze the raw survey responses from the polls. So we don't, we don't have that mostly. We, we do have some connection with YouGov. Uh, political scientist Doug Rivers is in charge of YouGov and they do lots of advanced statistics there. Uh, but mostly for our forecast, what we're using are public polls. The same ones that you can go by Googling, going on the web and going to Real Clear Politics or, or some other site that has poll aggregation. We use state polls and we use national polls. So we want both. It's funny because some people are like, hey, the election's 50 states, you know, hello, it's all state polls, who cares about the national poll? But that's not right because the states go together, swing. So there's information in the national polls. If the state polls are perfect, you wouldn't need the national polls too, but I've heard a rumor the state polls aren't always perfect. It makes sense. State polls are, are generally kind of lower budget operations. Um, so we use the national poll. So ideally we would actually use the state respondents within the national poll to estimate the states also, but for we don't really have the raw data. 
So we use the national post estimate, national trends, and the state post estimate, state trends, but we do it together. So we, we have a model for all of these. Um, these. These all represent different measurements. Now, a poll, and we have also, we've done some research. We looked at state polls in the two weeks before the election for, for the last four national elections. And we looked at the margin of error and we found that the actual error on average was about twice the margin of reported margin of error, like non-sampling error. Like you did the poll on a Saturday, you weren't getting the right people or there was some weird news event one day or, or, or who knows. Um, so we have, we include a term in our model for non-sampling error. But in addition to that, a poll is a snapshot, not a forecast. So we have a time series model, which allows the polls, we, we, we call it a reverse random walk because the idea is that there's some actual election outcome on November, whatever it is, the election day is. And then on the days before that, we imagine public opinion in the 50 states to, to follow a random walk that ends up at that point. It's a, car, it's a correlated random walk that is states that are similar to each other move together. Um, so when we put all those, we put all that information together and we put it in STAN, which is our probabilistic programming language or Bayesian inference engine. And then that give, we, we, it takes uh, like 20 minutes to run or something. And then we have our results. So then we, we refit the model every day. That's what goes on the Economist website. Well, we were looking at for a while. So it came out a couple months ago and said Biden had a 84% chance of winning. Now, just to be clear, it's, it's all the two party vote. It's Biden versus Trump. So if, in, in, it, it, if there's a new candidate, you kind of have to start over. The fundamentals predictions are still there, but you still have to, you, you're going to have new polls, right? Everything could change. So if Biden or Trump gets coronavirus, gets a stroke, decides to drop out, you know, there's a coup in the Republican Party and they and Rick Santorum's running for president, you know, whatever it is, then um, you're going to like, you know, that'll change. So our forecast is, is, is conditional on that. Or if there's a major third party candidate, doesn't seem so likely, but you never know. Um, so we had Biden at 84 percent. And then People are pointing out, well, the prediction markets were having Biden at like 60%. Now, who are we to say we know more than the prediction markets? Well, that's easy. Who are the prediction markets to say they know more than a bunch of sophisticated political scientists, right? Like, prediction markets are just a bunch of people with a few bucks to spend. They're not, they're not efficient markets by any means. Like, for example, once we had our forecast, I was going with the idea of, of investing my life savings in the prediction market. Um, in fact, I had a pretty good idea which was first I could bet, a, you know, I could borrow some money and bet a couple million dollars on, on Biden. And then I was pretty sure that the poll, that the prediction market was going to shift toward Biden, because after all, like he's clear favorite. Um, then I could just buy some Trump shares and I'd have the perfect arbitrage and I would make money and I could liquidate right away. Um, but I, I thought it was kind of maybe a little bit unethical to use my political science skills to take money away from some day trader types. And also, you can't really bet more than like a thousand bucks on these things. And it's probably illegal too. I'd have to get some Australian or British friend to do it. So put it together and I, I wasn't going to do it. Prediction markets are not particularly liquid. Uh, I don't take them that seriously. They have gradually been moving toward Biden. Uh, then the days go on and Biden was continuing to do well in the polls. He's at about 54%, 55% in the polls. He's about 54% in the, in the forecast. It's funny because when people said like, what are you doing saying that Biden's so likely to win? Like you're overweighting the polls. It's only, it's only July. And we say, well, it's not, it's not just the polls. It's also the, the economy isn't going well and Trump is, is unpopular. So that's, that's not good either, right? Uh, we found that we had a 99% chance that Biden would win the total vote. Not the, it was like 91% chance he'd win the electoral college, but 99% chance he'd win the vote. Because as you may have heard, right now the electoral college is such that the Democrat needs to win about 51% of the two party vote in order to win the, in the electoral college. Seems a little screwed up, but, but there you go. That's just the way things are. Um, so it was a little, 
upset about this 99%. Like I, I felt like, I don't know, how do you even think about 99% of the two party vote? Like a 99% chance of winning. Like, it's not like we, we haven't even had a hundred presidential elections in American history, right? So like, what is it? How do you even calibrate that? So we decided it would be easier to understand this by looking at the 50% interval. So we had a 50% chance that Biden would get between, um, it was like 53.2% and 55.2% of the two party vote. You know, was, we're kind of running this around in our head a few thousand times. Like, what do we think? Like, yeah, 53.2 to 55.2 seems reasonable. If you had to press me, if I could take the inside or the outside, though, I would take the outside. Like, I think that interval is a little too narrow. I, I feel like we're maybe taking this fundamental space forecast a little bit too seriously. Um, so we, we went back to our model and kind of looked more carefully their error terms. And we decided that our forecast error term was a little bit too precise. We were a bit a bit too, we felt we were a bit too confident in our forecast. So we, we are, we did kind of change that error term. And, and now I think we have a 97.97% chance Biden wins the popular vote. There's a lot of subjectivity in this kind of thing. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. And, but we've really, we've tried our best to use all the sources of information that, that we can. That's the answer to your question. I can't hear you. You're silenced. You're muted. I'm going to interrupt your presentation. When when I read the methodology section, um, which was very thorough and uh, and clear, I thought that I read that you had made an assumption about a V-shaped recovery. No. And, we made no recovery as a, so one of the, I mean, actually a kind of leak in our model is that we don't make a forecast for our future predictors. So our fundamentals based forecast, I mean, this was something people wanted out. Our fundamentals forecast in March said that Biden was expected to get 50% of the vote or 51%. Now it says 54%. And that's because the economy has fallen apart and Trump's approval has declined. But each month, the forecast is based on predictions from what happened this month in previous years. So it's a kind of crude, it's kind of a hack. Like there's the model fit to March isn't the same as the model fit to April or the model fit to May and so forth. So it's really saying what happened in previous elections like based on how things were going in March in previous elections, how things were going in April in previous elections, May and so forth. So it's a kind of, that's one reason we felt we maybe needed a bigger margin of error because our model isn't making the most coherent use. It's making very coherent use of the polls. So like when we, when we do the polls, we're using all the polls and we have a time series model. But for the forecast, we're, we're doing it in a, in a more clumsy way. So now, now we have some uh, questions coming in from the audience and I wanna remind the members of the audience that they can submit questions either through the chat or through the Q&A function. Um, oh, I see two I'll answer in the yeah. Q&A right now. Okay. Great. So one is from um, Nicholas um, who says, how does the economist training on data resemble or differ from the pooling the polls process used in political science and from the 538 part process of adjusting for individual poll quality? <coughs> so. I'll say, okay, so 538 and Real Clear Politics do poll aggregation. So I, I don't know if they use a fundamental space forecast at all. Um, they might, but one thing they definitely do do is a kind of weighted moving average of the polls. So what are the polls now? That, yeah, that's what they do like for presidential approval. So if you've seen these presidential approval graphs, uh, if you're a real sucker, you just you know, look at the headlines and you see these, like one day Trump was at 49% in one poll, you think he was really popular, but no, that was just one poll. So they have poll aggregation is, is pretty straightforward. Um, it gets more complicated with the 50 states. If we did not, 
if we did not have the fundamental space forecast, that's what we, and, and we didn't have the time series model, that's kind of what we would be doing. Um, so then we would just, and right now it would give similar answers because the poll and the forecast are at the same place. Um, you, the, uh, Nicholas asked about adjusting for individual poll quality. So we have a few terms in our model. You can go, like the scan code is there, actually. It's all, it's all public. Um, you, what we, we have, we allow a bunch of error terms. So first, any poll can just be off because of binomial sampling variability, the square root of P times one minus P over N that you know about. The second thing is that we have an additional error term for each poll corresponding to non uncertain non-sampling error. Third, we have a national error term saying all the polls this year will, can be off. And we have statewide error terms too like that. All the polls could, they could just, this could be a year that's good for the Democrats or good for the Republicans in all the polls. Finally, we have polling house, oh, not finally. We also have polling organization effects so each polling house or organization has its own error term, which we estimate from data. They have priors, which are centered around zero. So we say that it's that we learn more about the, the, that some polls tend to be higher than others um, as we get more information. Finally, we have a correction term for polls that, so most, some polls adjust for party identification. Most of them don't, but some do. The, poll, the polls that adjust for party ID, we consider them our baseline. And we have a, yet another error term, which is its own time series, which is the difference between polls that do and don't adjust for party ID. And that's supposed to capture differential non-response, which is something we found in the 2012 and 2016 campaigns. So differential non-response is, is when your candidate is more popular and his supporters tend to be more likely to answer the poll. And so then he looks even better. So differential non-response tends to exaggerate poll swings. And that's actually an explanation for something that pu puzzled us for many decades, which was the convention bounce, which is why do the polls go up when during the convention? It's like it's the convention, most people don't even watch these conventions. And um, we think that much of it is due to the, um, partisans being energized and being more likely to respond to the, to the survey. So we have that. Um, second question is, how do you figure out what the variance covariance should be? Brad asked, what, how do you figure out what the variance covariance should be for the reverse random walk? This is an embarrassing part. Like, so, well, first there is, there, well, we use the same variance covariance for the reverse random walk as we did for the survey errors and also as we did for the errors in the um uh in the forecast in the fundamental space forecast not that they should all be the same but because it was hard for us to think about what to do now i think the right thing to do there would be to use the residuals the state residuals from the fundamental space forecast um we i don't know my I, my collaborator elliot didn't really want to do that he didn't feel comfortable leaning on it so much so he actually just created, he took like six variables that characterize the states, uh, like political and economic variables, and just took the covariance matrix of them, and then took the minimum, and then took that covariance matrix, and the six variables like tended to be correlated with each other. Um, the states tend to, the states are higher, and some variables tend to be higher on the others. And then he took the negative correlations and, and truncated them to zero. And then we took that and added positive numbers to everything in the covariance matrix to induce a, a more of a positive correlation. And then we kind of played around with it a little bit to see what looked reasonable. And, and in, when I say looked reasonable, we, we'd spend lots of time looking at 2008, 2012, and 2016. Um, so that's, yeah, it's not, not the cleanest thing in the world. Uh, this isn't being recorded, right? Nobody knows. It's all secret. Just you guys um, joke. Okay, Mick, Mer someone who has a like low on bells uh, handle says, uh, many of the state models don't have any polls according to the Economist website. Does that mean the fundamental model is driving the state? Yeah, so if you have no polls in the state, 
what it's going to be, it is going to be driven. The fundamental model gives state level predictions as well as national level predictions. But the, to say, I don't know, I don't know the details of that because I didn't do that part of the model, but roughly speaking, we're using the national prediction to get where Biden and Trump are going to be. And then the relative positions of the states were using where they were in the previous couple of elections, corrected for home state advantage. So you're really, you're starting with the electoral map from the last election. Um, then when you learn about individual states, it moves things around and you're right. If you have no polls in the state, then it's going to be where it was predicted. Um, now in, in 2016, there were, I think some of the state polls were off. I, I don't think those particular problems will arise. To some extent, we're adjusting for that because if they're not adjusting for party ID, then we're allowing that to be an error. But you know, obviously that ultimately it's the data or the data and if there are problems, there are problems. We've answered all your questions, excellent. Um, oh, I see one more question from Stephen. I was interested to hear you describe looking at the results of the analysis and revising the assumptions. How should we think about this step in inference? How can we combine making sure the model makes sense with still having the ability to learn something surprising? I, yeah, we've been thinking a lot about that. We call it workflow. So like we don't just fit one model, so we should be open about that. And it's tough, like especially when there's one target. That, the quick answer is that you have the ability to learn by looking at more complicated things, right? Like I was talking with someone just today, corresponding with someone about some really goofy model of epidemics and someone fit a model, like they didn't even fit it. It was just completely speculative. It's just like a kind of cute model and it's super cute looking, but there's like no way of checking it, comparing it to data. Um, then he was saying, like, if you do something like try to try to estimate the day to day rates of exposure to the disease or whatever, you'll do better. Like you'll learn you learn so much by confronting the model with real data. So we will see things, um, you know, if I'm not so worried, like if individual states are kind of drifting around, our model will let us see that. And we know because we did look at what we would have learned from 2012 or 2016. So it's somehow not, not magic. Like in 2016, it did give Hillary Clinton the edge because she was, well, she did, you know, she was winning in the popular vote in, in the vote and there were some close states and they hadn't been fully adjusted for in the polls. I think our model gave her like a 70% chance of winning. Um, I think we can learn stuff surprising. Like the, the fundamental space forecast is very awkward. It makes us upset. Like when the, we've done some playing around and when election day comes, our estimate is basically four fifth polls and one fifth fundamental space forecast. It's not just the polls, because even on election day, we know that all the polls could be biased. Uh, but so if, if Biden's supposed to get 54% of in the, in the fundamental space forecast, and he's supposed to get 49% in the polls, we would estimate 50%, something like that. On the other hand, like it's, we don't know what the fundamental space forecast is gonna be on election day, because it depends on economic and, and political conditions then. Um, but like, you know, there's something, kind of uncomfortable making about this adjustment, you kind of might feel like, let's not use the fundamental state forecast at all. But that's not really an answer because you have to somehow partially pull your model to something. Like you can't just use the poll aggregation because the polls could be off. And, and so you, you, at some point you, you have to commit. We put a lot of work, well really mostly Elliot and Merlin put a lot of work in, in March in getting the model, it was supposed to then all run by itself. But like, you know, that mo you know, these models run by yourself the same way that you can tell your Tesla to go to the supermarket and get you a quart of milk and come back home and not crash, right? They're not quite there yet. It's sort of supposed to, but it doesn't. Um, but this is how we learn, right? So better to put ourselves out there and look like idiots than kind of hide away and, and, and never try. That said, I wouldn't have done this except that the guy from The Economist contacted me. I would, like, for years, I, I, 
the only the first time I did forecast, my collaborator and I, when we're in in 1989, we we're writing a paper, and this was about why why um, public opinion polls fluctuate so much when the vote is so predictable. So that was kind of weird. Like we can kind of predict the vote, even people don't who aren't really people who even like if you're not like a real forecaster, everyone admits you can predict the vote to within like maybe three or four percentage points of the national vote. Yet public pre-election polls back in the day would vary by a lot more than that. So the question is, why is it? Why do the polls vary so much if the election is so predictable? So it's a great question. And to answer that question, we first had to do a little side project to show that the election was predictable. So I learned all about election forecasting back in 1989 because we wanted to make sure the election really was predictable. And that's when we learned about correlated error terms and, and all sorts of things that nobody knew about back then. Um, okay, I'm sort of starting to babble, sorry. Oh, there's more questions in the other question box. We can do this. Why do you think there has, James asked, why do you think there hasn't been a polling organization to coordinate high quality state level polls for every state? Is it a matter of cost? Well, kind of, I mean, to do a national poll, you like, you, if you want to get a thousand people nationally, that's a thousand interviews. If you want to get a thousand people in every state, that's 50,000 interviews, that's more expensive. So it's a matter of cost. You can estimate national opinions from, for state level opinions from national polls if you, you pull the data, but yeah, it's more like what's what's the interest in it. Um, I don't know that people really need a great poll of presidential preference in Wyoming, for example. Uh, Chris asks, does presidential debate performance play into the model? Uh, it is not in our model. I don't know if it's in anybody's model. I guess it's implicitly in the model to the effect it can affect the polls. Not a lot of evidence it affects the polls very much. In 2012, it, we found it affected the polls a little, but most of that was differential non-response. Richard said, you mentioned that you attempt to defend against overfitting fundamentals. Could you elaborate what process le led you to believe the fundamentals based model forecasts were in reason? I guess partly there's just other people have done forecasts and like the, the like very simple models can give you residual standard errors of three or four percentage points. So it, it doesn't, as long as it's a, if that's what our residual standard error is, like I feel like that kind of makes sense. Like it's hard not to get things right if you're forecasting. Like there's only been a few real landslides and they did correspond to cases where the president was popular and the economy was booming and it could just be a coincidence. But so that, that it's kind of that way. I mean, we, we kind of manhandled the forecast. So like, we, we made the residual standard error big enough that, that it was consistent with like other things that we had seen. Mike asks, you could add another variable change in GDP till the election, regress on that and see how your prediction looks. Um, I won't, it's too hard for me to think about that kind of live, but I'll just say generically, it makes sense to model what's going on during the election. We haven't really done that. I think that fundamental stuff is, has always been a bit of a black box. Um, I think, as I said, my colleagues tried to do something reasonable like there's this whole thing, like what do you use to use a change in GDP, the change in personal income, this or that, like presumably you use everything. It's not like there's a magic variable. There's been, one of the big points of debate has been, um, do you, um, wait, how do I say this? Um, that is it the economy or is it the perception of the economy? So after George Bush senior lost, in, 2000, in 1992, one thing that his supporters said was that the economy was already coming back. It just hadn't made its way into the reported statistics. And it's kind of an interesting question. Presumably it's a little of both. Presumably it's, it's how it's reported, but people are also reacting to, to reality. So I have this saying that Ronald Reagan was a statistician. And, and the reason why I say that was when he was running in 1980, he asked people, are you better off now than you were four years ago? That was taken sometimes as a, as a like a 
selfishness, like, oh, you better off personally. But I don't take it that way. I don't say that Reagan was telling people to be selfish. I think he was saying that your personal measure of the economy is relevant. So don't be fooled by the media, right? Don't, it's not what they're telling. Don't listen to when they tell you on TV that the economy is going well. Look at your own reality. And I think that was a, a reasonable thing to say, but it, it really brings, it, it's going to be, it would be impossible without, it would really be impossible to tease apart the real economy versus the perceived economy. And this has come up in this election. I mean, you see, what's scary is I could talk for hours. Like, it doesn't mean I know any answers, though. I'm just, like, good at talking, right? It's, like, it's kind of weird. Like, having a facility to talk doesn't mean we can really solve, solve any problems. Like, I remember I had a friend in high, did two friends in high school, and once they're getting into a political argument, then at one point, friend number two said to friend number one, okay, you're winning the argument, but that doesn't mean you're right. It just means you're out arguing me. I thought that was a very interesting point. Oh, I like that. It's like, it's kind of true. Like there are people who are good at arguing. It doesn't mean they're, it doesn't mean they're right. right? Um, so if you, the, the, the issue of like whether it's the, the, the real economy or the perceived economy, as I said, we can't, these are, these are things that like we can't know. Oh, right. So one thing that comes up now is the economy isn't doing well because people are afraid of getting sick, right? And so they're not going out and flying and, and shopping and, and going to the zoo and, and stuff like that. And so that's bad for the economy. But on the other hand, do people blame the president? It's not his fault that there's a disease. Well, it kind of is his fault. But, but and people are blaming him for coronavirus. On the other hand, the polls seem to say that people think Trump is better than Biden on the economy. Like if it's the economy is the question. So like it, it's, it's not... You can't, you can't like try to, if you're, you can't just start spinning stories, right? Like you can start spinning a story. People blame Trump for coronavirus, coronavirus causing the economic problem, therefore they're blaming him for the economy, but, but maybe they don't, right? It's, it's really, so there are things, so people, I've talked to people who said that, well, really 54% for Biden isn't right because look, like, that's that's have to do with the economy and this is coronavirus and then we say yeah but like what can you do like this is what the economy is and and are you so sure that when people come to the ballot that you know when it's time to vote that they won't be they they won't be kind of ready for a change like how it's it's hard to know also like if it's not 54 percent it's 52 percent like I, it, there's no way the conditions actually favor the president at this point uh, Jacob says Trump's approval on the economy. Oh, this is where you're saying Trump runs well, even or above water while he's polling well below Biden. Meanwhile, Andrew Cuomo's approval rating is 66%, while New York's unemployment rate is 70, 17%. Uh, is it possible that your fundamental base forecast is just out of scope? I think it is out of scope. I think we do have, there is something in the model that has a certain nonlinearity in it. So it doesn't, it doesn't say that the economy dropping by 10% 10 per, 10 is twice as bad as dropping by 5%. There is something in there. I, I, I can't, it is very, it's hard to answer that. Like, uh, I guess ultimately we just have to say, here's our model and here's our uncertainty. Like, and it, it like, where do you draw the line for like how much, like, there's kind of two extremes, right? So one extreme is you do completely hands off. We fit a regression model, or we, like, you know, we program AlphaGo or whatever to solve, to, to, to solve it and we take whatever it takes and we just say it's completely objective, but like we're, we don't know what to trust. The other extreme is you go and tinker with every number, but as you say, if you start tinkering with every number, you lose your ability to, to learn much. I guess I'll just say that we are pretty much ultimately gonna be relying on polls the fundamentals based forecast is where we're partially pooling to. Ultimately, if we partially pool to 54% or 52% or 51%, it's just not gonna be that different. Um, you know, there are kind of public relations issues. Like if, if Biden gets 49% of the popular vote and then we want, you know, we predicted there's a 97% chance he would you know, win, then we look bad and if, if we predicted, but like, what do you say about that? Like. Who cares whether we're predicting 97% or 99%? Like it's, 
it's kind of interesting. It's but like like it's it's not clear exactly what you're going to do. Like you can come up with a hypothetical like business investment scenario where you compute your expected loss from like selling shares in the Trump organization and like you know blah 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 blah. But like these ultimately these probabilities are just just data summaries. Mm -hmm. We 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 want to do our best, but that's about it. Um, Mick Murring, uh says, "Are you able to use Mr. P on some of the polls from the YouGov?" We have been doing that, or I haven't been doing that. YouGov's been doing that. I think we've done, I think that once we've done that, we've just been calling them state polls. I, I don't think we've been into we haven't integrated it into our model. Uh, Daniel, you mentioned that national indicators are just averages of states, but with state level fundamentals. I think we do use some, I, they, I don't know. I wish I had my collaborators on this. I think they might be using state level economy. I mean, they're obviously using previous state votes. Are they using state economy as a predictor? I kind of think they are, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, which states do you wish had more polls? I, I wish all the states had fewer polls. Benjamin asked which. I, I'm, I just think there's too much polling. This horse race polling is just like a scourge. Uh, it, it's like, I think you know about the the aquifer, that Oglala aquifer that's under like the you know upper Midwest, and they've been they've been mining water out of it for a hundred years, and pretty soon like they're not going to be able to grow anything in uh, North Dakota and Nebraska and all that. Well, I kind of feel like survey responses like that for for eighty years, pollsters have been um, or seventy years pollsters have basically been asking people survey questions and certain people have been responding for free because out of their goodwill now like there's been too much so I I don't think I, I'm I'm not like part of team polling I use the polls I do survey research I get paid to do it but like I don't wish there were more of these polls I wish there were, were fewer uh, Mike are the model predict projections better for later years the former or the later the pre model projections are better for more recent years. So this is polarization. So it's just elections are more predictable now than they used to be. Uh, I don't think I, I, if Ronald Reagan were running against Walter Mondale today with the same economy, I don't think Ronald Reagan would get 60% of the vote. I think he'd get, I don't know, 56% of the vote, something like that. Um, I mean, look at how many people voted for Donald Trump, you know. <laughs> or Hillary Clinton, you know, they both got votes, like, go figure, right? Um, Peter asks, uh, presumably the condition of the US economy would predict a massive landslide against Trump. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, it, our prediction does not give a massive landslide against Trump. And I think that's because that I think it, it, it we put something in originally that kind of a non a nonlinear diminishing returns term to the economy. But then the other thing is it's not just the economy, it's also incumbency and approval. And, and there's also like, basically we have the whole model is flatter in recent years because it's a Democrat versus a Republican. So most people would just like, most people would vote for, for the, the devil himself if it was their party, like running against the other party. So I don't, again, I don't know the details of the model, but we're not just fitting a straight line comparable to data back to 1948. So, so yeah, if you stuck, if you stuck, uh, if you gave Jimmy Carter this economy or you gave Kennedy, well, he didn't run for re-election, you know, unfortunately, whatever. But if you give past presidents this economy, then sure, maybe that would be the case. Our model doesn't predict that, but I don't know if that's a virtue of our model or kind of how it's been tuned that if it ever got to the stage it was doing that. I don't know. I mean, you could imagine Biden winning in a landslide. You know, who's to say? It's, given the polls, it still seems unlikely. He's only polling at 54%, right? But it's, it still could happen. Um, Fernando, uh, how does your model protect itself from polling herding? Not in the, the fun, it's not the fundamentals anchor that protects us from polling herding. What protects us is that we have a correlated error term. And so we are allowing for the polls to have a common correlated error. I mean, we're not protecting from it, but like if they're, oh, wait, wait, wait I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, I was, when you said hurting, I was thinking of correlation between states, but that's not what you mean. When you say hurting, I believe what you mean is that the pollster 
tweaks their numbers to agree with other polls. I'm pretty sure that's what you mean. So how do we stop? Well, if there's enough polling hurting, we're of course completely sunk, but my, I'm not an expert on this, but my impression, I guess I'm more of an expert than you all are, but whatever. My impression is that what hurting happens is happening at the very end, right before the election. This is not so much hurting now. At this stage, pollsters are, are like the cost of being wrong is not so high and, and there's an actual benefit from being an outlier if, if things go in your direction. So I wouldn't really expect to see hurting now. If there's hurting at the very end, what's protecting us is we're fitting an entire time series. So we don't, our model does not allow for big swings in the last two weeks of the election. So love it or not, that's the way the model is. It doesn't, it allows for things to still be wrong on election day, but it doesn't really allow for the polls to, to jump in that way. Um, so that, uh, James asks, have you backfit any of your models and historical data to see what predictions they spit out? Yeah, we kept over and over again doing 2008, 2012, and 2016 and looking and seeing if the results made sense. Um, why did we think that, but yeah, so um, our previous model, in 2008, 2012, 2016, you don't get 99%. Um, I think maybe in 2012, we we're getting pretty high percentages, but not 99%. I guess we can't, I mean, I guess you could back fit to 1984 and you get 99.99%. .99%. We, I don't know that we have tried to do that. Like, I, I think the, I think we've only been, we've actually only stuck in polls since, since 2008. Um, John asks, how sensitive do you think models are to the mode of voting? Uh, what if vote by mail? Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, that's one of these things where like you could conceptually you either say uh, we have no idea or you say, well, that's in the error term. You never know what's going to happen. But I haven't, we have not tried to address that. Like in that, with questions like that, I'd say what we're doing is a little more in the ends of a poll aggregator. Like we're aggregating the polls and this is, and pooling, partially pooling towards the forecast. That's what we're getting. We're not really trying to solve things that aren't there. Um, it is a concern. I mean, I read the newspaper too. You know, I, I like as a citizen, I, we got, I, we sent in for absentee ballot in our primary election. Well, the primary election in New York didn't matter, but you never know. Like you always hear about these situations where some, some, like fringe candidate gets a bunch of their friends to come and vote for them. So like, you know, we wanted to vote and we, we got the absentee. I got my absentee ballot in the mail on election day with a note saying it has to be postmarked the day before election day. So I couldn't do it. And then I was reading the paper. They threw out a bunch of ballots because they post office could, forgot to postmark them. I mean, it's like, it's a scandal. And I mean, there's a lot of things like that. So, you know, there's vote suppression, all that. Like, I don't know. It's funny because they talk about people waiting for hours. I remember when I was a kid living, growing up in the suburbs and my parents waited for like an hour to vote. Like just, it was expected. But nowadays, like most places you don't have to wait for an hour to vote. And it's really not good that some places people do. It's completely unfair. Um, the John Krosnick claimed that the 2016 election went to Trump because of ballot order effects which is not a completely ridiculous claim. I don't think he's right, but I think he's close. You can look at it because most states, like many states have rules that the, the candidate is first on the ballot, like is the one who the governor or something like that, or who won the previous election. They have different rules. Um, it's hard to estimate the ballot order effect in presidential elections because there haven't been that many presidential elections. There's some data from California because California uses a different ballot order in every congressional district. Um, it's, it's kind of, so I think it, basically if you look at the close states, there were certain close states like, Minis like well, Minnesota went for Clinton, um, uh, but like if you look at certain like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Florida, you can go through each state and say which ones if there was no ballot order effect would Clinton might have won. And when you kind of work it through, it all comes down to Florida. And I think if the ballot order effect had been like 1.2% of the vote, that would have been enough to swing it. Now, is the ballot order, I, it's hard for me to believe that the ballot order effect in the presidential elections is as high as 1.2%. But I don't know, John Krosnick thinks it is. It's like kind of hard to know. In minor, off, you know, minor offices, it's high. It could be 5% or more in, in minor offices. 
So there are a lot of things like that, which don't matter unless it's a close election, but if it's a close election, they do. And we, and we don't think that much about them. I mean, the, you know, suppose there should be people, not me, right? There should be people who think about stuff like that. Like there should be people counting all the votes and it's, it is kind of a scandal. And, uh, Richard said, what if there are a bunch of shark attacks and all the Midwestern sports teams are on a losing streak in, in November? Uh, I think that was a joke. Um, I don't actually think that there's evidence that shark attacks and sports games have much effect. Although on the margin, um, you know, anything can, anything can happen. I guess we'd be thrilled if the Midwestern teams were, I guess in Michigan, you're happy that they're not doing sports. That for one year, you won't lose to Ohio State. So that's like a, a real plus right there. Michigan, Ohio State are a rare symmetric rivalry. You talk, you go to Michigan, you say Ohio State, you go Ohio State, you say Michigan, everybody laughs. I remember when I taught at Berkeley, whenever I'd mention Stanford, the students all hits. You go to Berkeley, you go to Stanford, and you mention Berkeley, they don't care at all. So it's like Michigan, Ohio State are like Harvard and Yale. They're like symmetric rivals. But Berkeley and Stanford had this asymmetric rivalry. It was, I guess it was more like Michigan and Michigan State. So one of these things. Uh, is it time for me to stop? It's been an hour. Do you want more? Like, what's what's the plan here? Well, let's see. Let's see how uh, we do with uh, whether there are any additional questions. Let me ask you this question, Andrew. For a pre-election pollster uh, who has to produce a likely voter model, they 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 rely uh, on they they start often by thinking that the electorate this time is going to look like the electorate last time, and so they think about how their sample should be configured. Um, is there an advantage in your kind of model over that problem of likely voter modeling? Or, or how do you see that? You know, I don't know. I've, I, it's likely voter modeling is, is tricky. So one of the issues is that you want to get the, the likely voters are people who are more enthusiastic. But more enthusiastic people are also over, more likely to respond to the survey in the first place. So one thing I point out is that in a presidential election, voter turnout's about 60% of the eligible voter population, but survey turnout is like 5%, right? Like how, what percentage of people respond to surveys? So whether you respond to a survey, it's much more contingent than whether you, whether you vote. So you don't, like, it's, it, you can easily see you can easily see these likely voter screenings overcorrecting. You know, nonetheless, at some level, you gotta believe they're professionals and that the likely voter screening shouldn't really be worse than doing nothing. Like it's like, how do you, like, it's hard to be a poll aggregator and, and, and have such a negative view of the pollsters. Like well, Rasmussen polls, they, they're notorious because they have percentages that add up to 108%. But like real pollsters, like that shouldn't be the case. Um, so, but this is not something I've thought that hard about. If you post stratify by party ID, that should help. And uh, some people suggest that we're in a period of um, accentuated voter suppression and do uh, the ability of the parties to influence levels of turnout uh, affect or are they likely to affect the accuracy of models? Oh, I think they're not really going to affect the accuracy of models. I think these are small compared to the other errors in the model. But I mean, it's again, it's a concern. I mean, it's a concern at different levels. First, it's a concern at the level of like the winner of the election being someone who got fewer votes, which has like happened now a few times recently. Um, it's also, there's also uh, like what the Supreme Court talked about in 2000, which was the, which was like confidence. So first, very directly, you can have the minority candidate win, right? Second, you can have a lack of confidence in the electoral system. You can have, you know, masses of, of citizens who feel they're not truly represented because the election wasn't fair. Third, it's the threat of this. So you can, Parties, if parties can threaten to do vote suppression, then they can use that as a political 
bargaining chip to get things. And that's like the idea of using vote suppression. The idea of saying, I won't do vote suppression if you give me like a tax cut, like that's kind of horrible, right? Like it shouldn't be, shouldn't be used in that way. Then there's the, the idea that if you think the other side can do vote suppression, you feel you have to get extra votes. And that's why you could say it's great to be motivated. But on the other hand, that could affect the positions you take. Like if you knew that you only needed 49% of the vote to win the election, then you can, you can take a very slightly more extreme position, right? And you don't have to be, you know, Anthony W. Downs, right, to capture this idea that if you don't need as many votes, you, you can have, you, that could affect policy. So there are many levels of this. Um, and I think the thing recently people have been talking about who wins and also the idea that people might not accept the, the outcome, but then they're down ballot races and um, so forth. Uh, Dallas asks, how should we think about the uncertainty that is or is not captured by the model? It sounds like you're bracketing certain extraordinary events, such as changing candidates. Yeah, I, I, I think you just kind of have to be explicit. Like, but like, it's sometimes hard to draw the line exactly. So yeah, if either candidate were replaced, we'd have to redo it. On the other hand, if either candidate were replaced, I think this would be a good starting point. I, don't, I actually don't think a replacement candidate would do much different. Like, so if, if, if Biden, you know, if Biden gets this proverbial stroke and is replaced by Stacey Abrams, I guess she'd get about the same too. I mean, you'd want to poll her and see. And, and similarly, if we have, you know, Mike Pence or whatever, I don't think it would be that different. Um, one thing that sometimes comes up, which has happened, one thing I want to say is that a lot of things people talk about have happened before. So we haven't had any candidates dropping dead during the campaign but we have had vice presidential candidates replaced. We've had, um, we have had candidates abandoned by their own party. So in 1964, in 1980, in 1984, large segments, uh, and, and to some extent in 2008 and 2016, uh, large segments of one party abandoned were, you know, candidates were abandoned by leading people. Like Colin Powell supported Barack Obama. Um, so it, like, I, I think of that, I don't think that our model is contingent on whether that happens. I feel like that's part of the regression model. So when the economy is doing badly, it's more likely that you're going to get abandoned. Like that's kind of one reason why the coefficient is what it is. So I, I think of the internal party dynamics as being somewhat endogenous, which, you know, again, is kind of really means I'm just not modeling it. So like, because the flip side is if you have more information, you can, you could theoretically try to use it. Uh, but then, you know, ultimately, like you, I, you can't overthink the fundamentals based model because the polls do really give us so much more information, especially as the election gets closer. Okay, we can uh, <clears throat> see whether there is uh, any other questioning that comes from the to Vince. Uh, how do you forecast election day turnout? I have not looked into that. I think we're just kind of forecasting the vote share by state. So we don't, we don't really have a model saying, oh, maybe turnout's going to be higher among old people and that'll help one party or the other. Um, what do we do about undecided voters? I think we just ignore the undecided voters. So what survey, what pollsters do is when people are undecided, they push them to decide. And the general belief among pollsters, which I guess I share, is that voters, whether you, saying you're undecided is like how you talk. It's like, it doesn't mean, uh, being undecided, if you say you're undecided, it doesn't really mean you're halfway between the two parties. It really just means you don't like to say. So if you, the so-called leaners, those are people, well, okay, you're not going to tell me who you want to vote for. Who do you, which way do you lean, right? What, what's your lean? Um, that's, that's just as good. Like we, leaners are, are said to be just as strong partisans as the people who respond right away. So they get all, they, they do, they also, they ask the survey question. They don't say, they didn't say who you plan to vote for. They say, who would you vote for if the election were held today? And the reason why they say that is because you get more response that way. And some research suggests that that's just as good. 
it just you just basically get more responses. Um, so yeah, the few people who still don't respond even after they get pushed, they're just not counted. Are you concerned as a statistician or as a political scientist or as a citizen that in two out of the last five elections, a person who didn't receive a majority of the votes became the president of the United States? Um, yeah, I'm concerned. I mean, it, it, it does seem, it seems like a problem. Um, it is, I, it's, um, <laughs> I guess it 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 ha it's um yeah doesn't seem right to me. A breakdown in the system of the electoral college, the suitability of the college, or yeah, I mean it's hard to you know. I guess it's it's like, hard to know, but it, it does seem like uh, not the way it's supposed to be. It does seem it does seem like a decline in literacy, in, like, literacy and illegitimacy. It's a funny thing though. So let me tell you, I'm going to tell you like a bunch of years. Okay. 1880, 1884, 1888, 1960, 1968, 2000. Those are all of the tied elections. So it's kind of funny. There were three in a row that were like tied within 1% of the vote. So what was happening? Well, you know, before the Civil War, there was not really a stable party system ever, as, as you know. Then, then, then there was a Civil War period, um, and it took a while for, like, there was, well, of course, the, the Republicans lost the election of 1860, 1876, but they did a dirty deal, and so they became president. In the 1880s, the two parties were even. Then there was, uh, soon after, the uh, system of 1896, and Republicans won just about every election after that for a long time, except, well, Woodrow Wilson run in a three-way race, and then he got reelected in close election in 1916. Then there was Roosevelt and all that. Then after Roosevelt and Truman and Eisenhower, then we started having a bunch of close elections. So if you just look at American history, we haven't had that many close presidential elections. There was this brief period in the late 1800s of high mobilization, especially among white voters, and then are white male voters. Um, and then there was what's been happening. So it's not, there's a lot of things. Another thing people talked about is the relative size of the states, the overrepresentation of small states in the US Senate. So in the, in the early part of the Republic, the largest states were only maybe seven times as large as the smallest states in population. Now they're 50 times large. So it's the overrepresentation of small states is much higher than it, much, much more consequential than, than it used to be. So that's the way systems are, right? They're developed in a certain way and they, they don't always adapt so well. Well, uh, I wanna thank you, Andrew, for a very interesting uh, uh, presentation and interaction with our participants. Um, we appreciate your being with us here tonight. And uh, I want to remind our participants that we'll be having another presentation uh, in a Blaylock lecture tomorrow evening uh, at time. Thank you again, Andrew. Okay, well, nice to speak with all of you, uh, I students, and, and I see that there are some grown ups in the audience too. So I appreciate all of you who came to that. Have a good evening. You too.